ice cream. Get your ice cream. Sit back, relax, and turn on your Tell Me Vision. TV debuts of 1969. 1969 was a weird year for television. There was a lot of output, but only a handful of the new shows went on to become major hits. Some have gained a cult following over the years. Many more have been almost entirely forgotten. A lot of the shows that initially flopped are as interesting to look at as the successes. Sometimes you'll wonder, what were they thinking? Other times you'll wonder, why didn't this take? The biggest genres this year were comedy, dramas and soap operas, game shows, and music shows. That isn't to say other types of shows weren't successful in 1969, but the ones I've mentioned had the greatest output this year. Action Shows Then came Bronson. This lasted just one season of 26 episodes on NBC. Michael Parks plays the hero, James Bronson. Bronson was a newspaper man who became disillusioned with the man, so he took to the road on his motorcycle doing good deeds. Probably the best thing that came out of this series is a skit that spoofed it on the short-lived series Pat Paulson's Half a Comedy Hour. In this recurring skit, called Then Came Paulson, Pat Paulson rides a motorcycle with training wheels and gets into some crazy situation. This is funny, even if you don't know it's a spoof of an actual show. Children's Shows H.R. Puffin Stuff This is one of the many children's shows from Sid and Marty Croft. It is amazingly well remembered and popular, despite the fact that it ran for only one season of 17 half-hour episodes. All the episodes aired in 1969, but were rerun on TV for years. H.R. Puffin Stuff himself was a friendly dragon who also happened to be the mayor of Living Island. This was a very surreal show that combined human characters with puppet characters. Kukla, Fran, and Ollie This revival of the classic kids show lasted just two seasons on PBS. It debuted when the network was still called NET, National Educational Television. A more popular series that debuted on NET this year would be Sesame Street. This amazingly long-running series hit the ground running. It never really struggled. However, the show really faltered after the 1990s decade. As of 2023, the show still exists in some form, but it's not the Sesame Street that any longtime fan really knows. The real Sesame Street excelled in a lot of ways. Besides the funny, interesting Muppet characters, it also had a good cast of friendly, likable human characters. There were some neat little cartoons interspersed with all this. It was educational, but you never felt you were listening to a lecture. Much of it was entertaining, with little bits of lesson material worked in. It was very clever. For many years, the major puppet character was Big Bird. He was my top favorite Sesame Street Muppet when I was growing up. And who could forget the greats like Cookie Monster, Telly Monster, Grover, Bert and Ernie, The Count, and so many others. Pippi Longstocking this Swedish TV series was based on the classic book series. It is well remembered, but lasted only 13 episodes. I remember watching the English dub versions of these shows on TV and in elementary school. The books were funny, and the show captures the spirit of those books perfectly. The series was followed by two feature films in 1970. Pippi was a weird but wonderful girl hero who always had something going on. The Sherry Lewis Show this is not to be confused with the popular show of the same name that ran on NBC from 1960 to 63. This new series lasted through 1976 on the BBC in Britain. Sherry Lewis and her famous puppet character, Lamb Chop, kept active on television since their early heyday, but it wouldn't be until 1992 when they really hit pay dirt with the PBS series Lamb Chop's Play Along. Comedy Shows The Benny Hill Show one of my all-time favorite TV shows. I grew up with Benny Hill, and the show is still funny. In my opinion, it's still the best comedy show Britain ever produced. Benny himself didn't have to do too much to be funny. He just was. He 
He had an interesting supporting cast. Jackie Wright, the little bald guy he always slapped on the head, was my favorite. Henry McGee usually played the extremely British characters and served as the straight man for Benny shenanigans. Bob Todd was the rather tough looking old guy. Rita Webb was the homely, heavyset older woman. She was extremely funny and obviously a good sport about things. There were so many great people involved in the show, and everyone remembers the sexy girls on Benny Hill that he later dubbed the Hill's Angels. My favorite skits were the ones that were filmed like modern day silent movies. They were pantomime with sped up filming and a lot of crazy activity. The show would typically end with one of these skits with everyone running around while the tune Yakety Sax was playing. This tune is also referred to as the Benny Hill theme. The Benny Hill show was very heavy on songs, but if there was any song that defined the series as much as Yakety Sax, it was an instrumental version of the song Gimme Dat Ding. It was played very regular in the series, especially in the earlier episodes. Believe it or not, this was not the first TV series to go by the name of The Benny Hill Show. He had been making TV shows sporadically under this name since 1955. He was purely a British phenomenon back then. In 1969, when he joined up with the Tim's Television Company and broadcast on the ITV network, The Benny Hill Show became an international sensation. The show was also a punching bag for censorship and people who wanted to find controversy. I watched this show with my family when I was a little kid and never did see what some people called unfit for television. The girls were sexy, but a lot of other TV shows had already done or were still doing the same thing. The Dean Martin Variety Show is a good example of this. There was ethnic humor, but none of it was mean-spirited. We all know political correctness is a pile of crap. Those who want to say they believe in it are pompous and hypocritical. Anything that makes people genuinely laugh is not a bad thing. Everything that Benny Hill did had a cuteness to it. He wasn't an insult comic. Most people must have felt like I do about the Benny Hill show because it ran an impressive 20 years. There was one special in 1977 and another in 1991. Audiences still love this show today. The Bill Cosby Show not to be confused with The Cosby Show from the 1980s that was a much bigger and longer lasting hit. This was Bill's first solo TV series after his success in I Spy. This ran on NBC for just two seasons. Bill Cosby played Chet Kincaid, a PE teacher in Los Angeles. It just didn't take with audiences at the time. When The Cosby Show started in 1984 and became such a mega hit, the Bill Cosby Show was shown in reruns and got rediscovered. Probably the coolest thing about this series is the funky theme song, Hickey Burr, that Bill wrote and performed with Quincy Jones. The Brady Bunch Everyone thinks of this as a 1970s show, but it actually started in late 1969. It ran for five seasons through 1974. Some people mistakenly believe the show ran through most of the 1970s. The confusion comes from the fact that the spin-off variety show series, The Brady Bunch Hour, ran from 1976 to 77. This TV series was wildly successful and spawned a cartoon series, The Variety Show, TV reunion movies, and two sequel series, The Brady Brides in 1981 and The Brady's in 1990. The Courtship of Eddie's Father This series had a respectable three-season run on ABC. It was based on the 1963 movie starring Glenn Ford. Bill Bixby was the star of the series. Bill played Tom Corbett, a widower with a young son named Eddie. Eddie desperately wanted a mother, so he did everything he could to manipulate his father's relationships in an attempt to get a new mom. Bill Bixby had been in TV and movies before this. He also did a lot of stuff after this. But it wasn't until 1977 that he gained his greatest commercial success with the Incredible Hulk TV series. The Debbie Reynolds Show This series lasted just one season of 26 episodes on NBC. After the success of I Love Lucy, that show's creator, Jess Oppenheimer, tried to reuse the formula more than once. His imitation shows were not as successful as the original. This series even had two of the Lucy writers, Bob Carroll Jr. and Madeline Davis. Why didn't it take? 
Debbie Reynolds was a big, well-liked star. It had a lot of the I Love Lucy crew. This wasn't even a bad show. I'm not much into imitations or rip-offs, but Jess Oppenheimer's Lucy-inspired shows were actually good. The only thing they lacked was Lucy. The Glen Campbell Good Time Hour This show debuted shortly after the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour was cancelled, but it's not the show that replaced the Smothers Brothers. In 1968, Glen Campbell hosted a summer replacement show for the Smothers Brothers that turned out to be well liked. It was called The Summer Brothers Smothers Show. In 1969, Glenn was given his own regular comedy variety show. It ran until 1972. You don't have to be a Glenn Campbell fan to like at least parts of this show. He had a lot of different musical and comedy guests on the show and they did lots of skits. All of this was essentially a spin-off of the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. It definitely had a more rural theme and it didn't touch anything that was remotely controversial. Hee Haw This is the show that officially replaced the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. It was a countryfied version of Laugh-In, but unlike those two shows, this wasn't the least bit topical. It featured a lot of country comedy and music. Roy Clark and Buck Owens were the hosts of a very large ensemble cast. The extremely sexy female members of the cast were referred to as the Hee Haw Honeys. It ran for only two seasons on CBS and was only canceled due to that network's rural purge. Basically speaking, any show that had a hillbilly country type theme was canceled because CBS didn't think these shows were cool or attracted Madison Avenue advertisers. They made a huge mistake, especially with Hee Haw. The show immediately went into syndication and ran until 1993. The series got bigger and bigger and drew major stars from the world of comedy, music, even sports. Whoops! Love American Style This is an unusual type of comedy show, as it was also an anthology series. Typically, only genres like drama, horror, or science fiction were presented in this format. With this series, you got a different comedy show every week. It ran for five seasons on ABC. In 1972, a pilot was made for the super successful TV show that would become Happy Days in 1974. Happy Days itself would be known for its many spin-offs. Mr. Deeds Goes to Town Wow, did this show bomb. It should have done better. It was based on the 1936 film starring Gary Cooper. Monty Markham was the star of this series. 17 episodes were made for ABC although one of them didn't air. In the series, Deeds goes to Manhattan after he inherits a large corporation from his uncle. He tries to correct the problems that his shifty uncle had caused. It would not be until 2002 that a successful reworking of the film, simply called Mr. Deeds, was released with Adam Sandler in the starring role. Monty Python's Flying Circus For all its extreme popularity, this classic sketch comedy series ran only four seasons in the UK. It became an international success and still maintains a faithful following. A lot of people call the original cast of Saturday Night Live the Beatles of comedy. It would be more accurate to say that the Monty Python cast were the Beatles of comedy. Their comedy smacked of that quirky Beatles influence. The cast members had extremely successful careers after this show but the two most successful players would have to be John Cleese and Eric Idle. Most Americans even know these guys from their various movie roles. Monty Python never really went away, and they made movies until 1983. After that, the various members went their separate ways into other projects, but they always take a little bit of that Monty Python vibe with them. The series and its movies are definitely not for everyone. The humor is weird and very British. It can also be very cynical. My World and Welcome to It This sitcom lasted just one season of 26 episodes on NBC. It starred William Wyndham, a good actor who had trouble getting into good projects. This was a weird setup for a show. It was based on the work of cartoonist James Thurber, famous for his material in The New Yorker magazine. The main character, however, was named John Monroe. His wife and daughter drove him nuts. 
John frequently had fantasies and daydreams. The show did okay in the ratings and got positive reviews. It even won two Emmys and was nominated for another. One of the wins was for Best Series, and one was for Best Actor, William Wyndham. Something about the show didn't jive with NBC, though, and they dropped it like a hot rock. CBS re-ran the show in the summer of 1972, but nothing was bringing it back. Today, this series is a great obscurity. Playboy After Dark This short-lived series ran only two seasons in syndication, but is still well-remembered. This is actually the second TV show centered around Hugh Hefner and his famous Playboy magazine. The first series was called Playboy's Penthouse, aired 10 years earlier, and was also in syndication for two seasons. Playboy After Dark followed the same style as the earlier series and was like a variety show with musical and comedy guests. The format of this hour-long show was like a typical Playboy party. And of course you saw a lot of the sexy Playboy playmates. In a lot of ways, you can say that this show emulated the party scenes on the popular Laugh-In show. But Laugh-In probably got the idea from the original Playboy show. Either way, it was fun and entertaining to watch. As far as the rock stars go, Playboy got a lot of acts that were a bit too wild for network shows. These included The Canned Heat, Deep Purple, Fleetwood Mac, Grateful Dead, Ike and Tina Turner, Iron Butterfly, James Brown, and Steppenwolf to name a few. Room 222 This successful comedy drama series ran for five seasons on ABC. Up until this time, you didn't see a lot of TV shows or movies about racially diverse inner-city schools. The movie Blackboard Jungle got the ball rolling in 1955, but it still wasn't a heavily explored theme. In the years since Room 22, and especially Welcome Back Cotter, the idea has been overdone. This series feels a lot more genuine about what they're saying versus much of the later TV and movies that simply want to glorify racial tension. Room 222 was primarily set in an American history class at Walt Whitman High School in Los Angeles. The show was actually quite gentle and promoted tolerance and understanding during a very turbulent time period. To Rome with Love First of all, John Forsyth is cool. He did a lot of good stuff before the series, namely the Bachelor Father TV series. That show ran for five seasons and was quite popular. It's amazing then that this series lasted just two seasons and has been largely forgotten. It aired on CBS and was about a recently widowed father who moved his family to Rome to accept a teaching position. Much of the humor came from the culture shock that he and his kids experienced in Italy. The show always did poorly in the ratings, even with the addition of Walter Brennan to the cast in the second season. Even crossover episodes with Family Affair and My Three Sons couldn't save the beast. Turn on. Here we go. The most popular, important show of the 1960s. Just kidding. That's a total lie. On the contrary, this show was one of the greatest all-time flops in television history. It was so bad that it was canceled midway through its one and only broadcast on February 5th. This happened either 10 or 15 minutes into the show. On many stations, the rest of the time slot was replaced with some kind of filler. A lot of stations in the later western time zones refused to air it at all. Two episodes were made, but the second was never aired. ABC aired this turkey after the other two networks rejected it. It was created by Ed Friendly and George Schlatter, the producers of Laugh-In. It was meant to be a Laugh-In imitation of sorts, but was much, much stranger. The premise of this show is that it was produced by a computer. It used a Moog synthesizer quite heavily for the music and had an almost a complete lack of sets, save for a white backdrop. The humor was almost entirely based on sex, which put a lot of people off. It was filmed instead of being presented live or on videotape, and there was no laugh track. Several jokes were presented on the screen in four comic strip type panels. The production credits were shown after each commercial break instead of at the beginning or end of the show, per tradition. 
there were so many quick cuts that it actually made some people physically sick. Tim Conway was the guest host for this first episode and wasn't meant to be a regular cast member. Somehow, this show still gets lumped in with his TV failures, but it wasn't really his show to begin with. Robert Culp would have been the second episode's host. Tim had a sense of humor about this awful piece of television in the following years. One semi-favorable thing he said about it in 2008 is that it was actually way ahead of its time. I'm not sure, even if you saw it today, that maybe that time has also passed. For sure, it was the biggest bomb of the 1969-70 TV season, and gained overwhelmingly negative response in the way of viewers actually calling into their TV stations. The worst thing of all is that no one found it funny. Turn On, an entirely unsuccessful TV show, is still talked about today in spite of itself just because it was too bad to be ignored. George Slatter always stood by his failed show, and thought it would be cool even by today's standards. I've seen enough of the show to know that's not true. I don't think it was as terrible as everyone made it out to be, but it wasn't as good as Laugh-In. Wasn't a very good show, and definitely would not work today, even in the era of very weird television. Dramas and Soap Operas the Bold Ones, The New Doctors The Bold Ones was the umbrella title for four different series, three of them starting in 1969. By 1973, all of them were finished. They were shown in what they call a wheel format, with the four programs being rotated on a weekly basis in the same time slot. This Doctor drama was the longest lasting of the four shows, running for four seasons. One of the stars was John Saxon, who was replaced in the final season. The Bold Ones, The Lawyers This lawyer show lasted for three seasons and starred Burl Ives, Joseph Campanella, and James Ferentino. The Bold Ones, The Protectors This cop show did the worst of the four shows. It lasted only seven episodes. Leslie Nielsen was the star. He played the cop, who was always at odds with the city's district attorney. This was long before his success with the Naked Gun films, where he played a not-serious cop. Bright Promise This daytime soap opera aired on NBC for not quite three years. 605 episodes were made. Film star Dana Andrews was originally the main star, playing a college president. Over time, the focus shifted to a college student named Sandra Jones, played by two different actresses throughout the series. A lot of prominent actors were involved with this show, but it just didn't take. Marcus Welby, M.D. This extremely successful doctor drama lasted seven seasons on ABC. It starred Robert Young, who had been previously successful with the sitcom Father Knows Best and his film career. Medical Center this is another doctor drama that lasted seven seasons, but on CBS. Unlike Marcus Welby, M.D., you don't hear people talking about this one too much today. Why? That's hard to say. It did alright in the ratings. It's just one of those once popular shows that falls through the cracks as time marches on. The New People This is a rare example of a regularly scheduled network series with 45 minute long episodes. Shows are usually a half hour or an hour, with some programs running 90 minutes. In the very early days of television, there were 15 minute shows. 45 minute long shows was just weird. This ran for only 17 episodes on ABC. Rod Serling wrote the pilot episode and helped develop the series. This was not what people expected of the Twilight Zone man. Considering that he used the pen name of John Phillips, even he must have had his doubts. A group of young college students survive a plane crash and find themselves on an island in the South Pacific. Now these young people are trying to build their own society. It was a reflection of the youth counterculture of the day, but this show flopped. Amazingly, it wasn't the first time the idea of all the adults getting killed off, leaving only the kids behind, was used. The best known example would be The Lord of the Flies, 
1954 novel that was adapted into a 1963 film. In that story, it was all real young schoolboys. An episode of Star Trek in 1966 called Miri followed the same basic idea where a disease killed all the adults on a planet, leaving only the children to survive. Then, of course, you have the Children of the Corn horror films that started in 1984. A religious cult of children takes control of a town after killing off all the adults. The New People is a rare example of this formula not working. The Survivors This primetime soap opera lasted only 15 episodes on ABC. It's curious why this show failed. It was based on the novel by the super popular writer Harold Robbins. He even had involvement with the series. The show starred a lot of big name talent including Lana Turner, George Hamilton, Kevin McCarthy, Ralph Bellamy, Jan Michael Vincent, Pamela Tiffin, Michael Bell, and Clue Gallagher among others. The show was cancelled in 1970 but they tried to keep it going. In 1971, two episodes from the series were re-edited into the TV movie The Last of the Power Seekers, but that was the end of it. It just goes to show that you can never gauge a show's success. On the outside, it looked like this had all the ingredients for success, but it flopped hard. Where the Heart Is This daytime soap opera on CBS ran not quite four years. It was set in a Connecticut town and based around the dysfunctional Hathaway family. This is another one of the early soap operas to focus on younger people. It actually had decent ratings, but was the poorest performer of CBS's soap operas. Advertisers weren't thrilled with it, as they didn't think young people were a profitable demographic. Out of the 907 episodes made, only 7 are known to exist. The ironic thing about this show's failure is that CBS had a major hit with their soap opera The Young and the Restless when it debuted in 1973. It was the most popular soap opera in America for over three decades and is still on the air in 2023. As the title implies, the show has a focus on younger people. A lot of soap operas ended up focusing on 20-somethings. In the 1960s though, TV shows for and about people under 30 had a hard time getting off the ground. The Young Lawyers This legal drama lasted just one season of 24 episodes on ABC. It's easy to understand why this one didn't wow audiences. Three young law students open a legal aid center to help the poor. They receive guidance from an experienced established lawyer. Yawn! Game Shows The Game Game this short-lived Chuck Bears produced game show lasted until 1970. It was a poor concept, based on psychology. One contestant played against three celebrities to come up with their choice of what a psychological panel decides the most fitting answer would be to a scenario. After a half hour of being analyzed, the contestant could win $100. Even in 1969, that amount of money was weak for a game show. This just wasn't a lot of fun. It's Your Bet This syndicated game show lasted four seasons. It was a reworking of the 1965 flop I'll Bet that ran only six months. This is another game show that involves celebrity couples. It had four different hosts during its run. Hal March was the first, but had to leave after the first few months due to declining health. Lyle Wagoner, who was on the Carol Burnett show at this time and later on Wonder Woman, was the final host. Letters to Laugh In The popular comedy series, Rowan and Martin's Laugh In, had a daytime game show spin-off. Gary Owens, the announcer on Laugh In, was the host of this game show. It lasted less than three months. I'm a huge fan of Laugh In, but I'm not surprised this show didn't take. It was a weak concept. Believe it or not, this show was made to replace the popular match game that had run for seven years on NBC where Match Game has been revived many times over and is one of the most popular game shows of all time, no one talks about letters to laugh in. Home viewers mailed their jokes to the show and were paid $2 each. 
the jokes were read aloud by a panel of four celebrities, two of which would be laugh-in regulars. Each joke was rated on a scale of minus 100 to plus 100 by a randomly selected audience panel. The highest and lowest rated jokes of the day won the viewers a prize. Trips to places like Hawaii were awarded to the highest rated joke of the week. A car was given away as the grand prize to the highest rated joke of the 13 week run. At least the prizes this show offered were awesome. Loman and Barkley's Name Droppers This ran for over half a year on NBC. The game had three stars and 20 contestants who played for a whole week with name droppers. These name droppers had a connection to one of the three celebrities in some way. The stars told stories about how they related to the name dropper. The contestants voted for the star whose story they believed. This was like the jacked up reversal of To Tell the Truth. On that game show, three people would claim to be a certain person. Only one of them could be the correct person. A panel would ask questions of the three people that they had to truthfully answer. Based on the answers given, the members of the panel had to decide who was the real person. The fun part was finding out who the real person was. I think people like to tell the truth better because it wasn't so confusing. To Tell the Truth This is the second version of the show. It ran in syndication from 1969 to 78. It started just one year after the CBS version ended. That show began in 1956, so you can see this had staying power. I like this version of To Tell the Truth quite a bit. Gary Moore was the host, and I think he did a very good job with it. When you watch these episodes, it looks like he's having a good time with it. Unfortunately, Moore's failing health brought this version to an early end. In late 1976, during the eighth season, he was diagnosed with esophageal cancer and had to leave the show to deal with the illness. Moore did return for one final performance for the season nine premiere in 1977. He also announced his final retirement from television. Moore's substitutes in these last two seasons weren't getting it and sadly the show was canceled in 1978. To tell the truth was not over by a long shot but it's clear that during this time, Moore was a big part of it. This version had some of the most interesting guests that ever appeared, including Stan Lee of Marvel Comics, Jack Mercer, the voice of Popeye, and Dusko Popoff, the real-life inspiration for James Bond, to name just a few. Queen for a Day This was a very short-lived revival of the popular game show that had already been done a number of times before. It was first on radio from 1945 to 57. It was then on NBC from 1956 to 60. Then on ABC from 1960 to 64. After this failed attempt, another try at it would not happen until 2004. That was also a dud. This show was probably most popular on NBC. It could be kind of a tearjerker. Each woman contestant would tell their tales of woe. Depending on how much the audience felt sorry for them, the woman deemed most deserving would be made queen for a day. The lucky winner would get whatever help she needed plus other prizes. The losing contestants were still given smaller prizes. My problem with this game show is that it's not really a game. A woman wins because people feel sorry for her. It's like watching a homeless person begging for change. I think it's good that the show wants to make women feel special, but it's also making them charity cases. This isn't a good thing to endorse, but for a lot of years, this show was very popular. Sale of the Century NBC premiered three game shows on the same date. Letters to Laugh In and Name Droppers were notorious flops. Sale of the Century did extremely well. This first version of the show lasted five seasons. A 1983 revival of the show lasted seven seasons. Contestants answered general knowledge questions for dollar amounts instead of points. These players could later spend their score on certain prizes and, as the title implies, it would be for a bargain if it was real money. Jack Kelly, one of the stars of TV's Maverick, was the host for the first two years. Wheel of Fortune 
This is not to be confused with the game show of the same name that started in America in 1975. This version was from England and lasted only two seasons. Michael Miles was the host. It is believed to be a totally lost series. I don't know how similar the English and American versions were to each other, but I find the idea of two game shows with the same name and the same basic idea of the wheel very interesting. The Who, What, or Where game. After Name Droppers bombed this year, NBC replaced it with a game show that was actually sort of successful, lasting a little over four years. This was a pretty straightforward type of game show. Three contestants played. They answered questions from a category. Each one dealt in various subjects. The question could be a who, based on a person, a what, based on a thing, or a where, based on a place. It was similar in some ways to Jeopardy, the hit game show that came on before it. Although this show ended in very early 1974, it managed to stay in the public memory. A new version was planned in 1988, but the pilot episode failed. It was then reworked and renamed into The Challengers. Dick Clark hosted it, and the show ran for almost a year from 1990 to 91. Since then, this show has been abandoned. Just about every game show from this time period, and for decades after, had a home version. Milton Bradley released a board game version of this game show that was nearly identical to what you saw on TV. This was an extreme oddity for home version games back then, and even now. Horror and Science Fiction Shows The Immortal The pilot film for the short-lived series aired on ABC. Almost a year later, it became a regular series. It lasted only 15 episodes and ended in very early 1971. The show's main character, played by Christopher George, had a unique kind of blood that made him resistant to almost all diseases, including old age. He is always pursued by evil, wealthy men who wanted to use him as a personal blood bank. It was actually a clever concept and probably would become a big hit if it debuted in a later decade when the public became far more dark and cynical. Night Gallery Rod Serling's second spooky series following The Twilight Zone. The setup was the same except for one major detail. The Twilight Zone dealt more with science fiction stories, where Night Gallery was more about horror stories and the supernatural. The pilot for this series aired on November 8th. The regular series started over a year later and ran for three seasons. The Twilight Zone is better known to most people and considered the definitive Rod Serling show but this series has its fans. It certainly fared better than his other series this year, The New People. Music Shows The Andy Williams Show This second version of the show started a year after Andy's break from television. It was a bit different than his earlier series. This actually embraced rock and roll performers, flower power, psychedelics, and especially comedy. This is when the Cookie Bear started. A stuntman by the name of Janos Prohaska wore a bear suit. The idea is that the cookie bear always begged Andy for cookies, but Andy wouldn't give him any. It was actually quite funny and never got tired. Ray Stevens would even come around and do his funny songs from time to time. This show also got people from The Smothers Brothers and Laugh-In. It lasted only two seasons on NBC, but is still well remembered. In 1976, Andy Williams would come back with a half-hour show in syndication. The Barbara McNair Show The singer and actress got her own musical variety show and it ran for three seasons in syndication. She got A-list guests and it was successful for a while, but this is one of those shows that you don't hear people talk about that much. The Engelbert Humperdinck Show He had his own short-lived comedy variety show that ran for six months. It aired on ITV in the United Kingdom and ABC in America. This wouldn't be his only foray into television and he remained a popular recording star. He's still active as of 2023. Jimmy Durante presents The Lennon Sisters. This comedy music show lasted just one season on ABC. It had to be an absolute terrible moment for both Durante and the Lennons. 
The show was designed to appeal to both young and old, but it didn't either. It actually had a good budget, top name guests, and decent writing. One big problem is that Jimmy Durante and the Lennon sisters had very different styles and didn't mesh. The Lennons themselves had split from their mentor Lawrence Welk the year before, so they were at a crossroads. Five episodes into the series, the Lennon sisters' father William, who at one time managed them, was shot and killed by a crazy man who believed he was married to Peggy Lennon, but her father was keeping them apart. As you can imagine, it had to be hard to go on after something like this, but the show went on. Durante's health was on the decline, and by 1972 he had largely retired from performing. If the show had been a super big hit, it wouldn't have lasted that long anyway. The show got poor ratings despite the fact that its competition was very weak. NBC had a drama called Bracken's World that ran against it, and CBS had movies. Still, this show got the axe. The John Davidson Show This very short-lived comedy music show aired on ITV in the UK and ABC in America. The Johnny Cash Show This particular comedy music show is still very well remembered and very well liked, despite the fact it ran only two seasons on ABC. There was a lot going on for it. Johnny's wife, June Carter, was with him on the show. Not only was she a good singer and musician, but she was also very funny. Of course he had the Carter family on the show. The Statler brothers, before they went on to their own success, was a big part of this series. He had many different musical guests on the show. Some would surprise you. The Monkees, Mama Cass, and the Guess Who wouldn't be people you would expect to see on this show. Johnny also had a lot of the country and folk music people that you would expect. Why did this show end so early? There were a few reasons. For one, there was a rural purge going on in 1971. CBS started it, but all the networks were eliminating shows with a country theme as it was deemed undesirable for hip advertisers. Another reason would be that Johnny Cash butted heads with ABC more than a few times. It was never as public as the battle between the Smothers Brothers and CBS, but Johnny refused to cut the word stoned from one of Chris Christopherson's songs and he persisted on bringing folk singer Pete Seeger on the show, despite the blacklisting Seeger received for performing an anti-Vietnam song on another network. These were just a few of the notable battles he won. The Leslie Uggam Show This comedy variety show really bombed. It lasted only 10 episodes on CBS. Why it failed is anyone's guess. Leslie Uggams was a popular singer and actress, she had a lot of big, current guest stars on her show. It may have had more to do with network politics rather than the official reason that it couldn't find an audience. It simply had too much going for it to fail so soon. This series premiered in the fall of 1969 after the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour got canceled earlier in the year. This show didn't actually replace the Smothers Brothers. Hee Haw was the show made to replace that. The Leslie Uggam Show, however, eventually occupied the Smothers time slot. Since CBS canceled the Smothers Brothers in a snit, they lost a ratings colossus. It went up against the super popular Bonanza on NBC and held its own. Leslie Uggams tried to do the same, but apparently couldn't compete. Perhaps Leslie's show wasn't promoted enough by the network. Some of her wildly popular guests included Dick Van Dyke, Sly and the Family Stone, Jim Neighbors, the cast of Hogan's Heroes, Bob Denver, Sammy Davis Jr., Ruth Buzzy, Mike Connors, Stevie Wonder, and The Temptations to name only a few. I'm sure if this was sufficiently advertised, Bonanza would have had some stiff competition. The Liberace Show Liberace was no stranger to television. He had done a version of The Liberace Show from 1952 to 59. Beginning this year, he transformed the Liberace show into what would become a series of 10 specials for British television on the ITV network. They appeared in America on CBS. All of these specials were made in color and shown in 1969. These specials were meant to serve as a summer replacement series for the Red Skelton show. 
This version of the Liberace show is notable. By the middle 1960s, he became more flamboyant and started wearing the funky costumes. He also picked up the nickname Mr. Showmanship. It became the style of Liberace that everyone knows best. These specials show that. It wasn't the last time he was on TV by a long shot. Music Scene This aired on ABC for just 17 episodes. It was another rare case of a 45-minute show, like The New People. Both of these shows were aired back-to-back to form a 90-minute slot. The idea was to compete against NBC's Laugh-In, a show that was actually 90 minutes. It didn't work. This wasn't a bad show by any means. It had a lot of comedy skits and musical guests. This show clearly didn't have the budget that Laugh-In did, so competing directly against that was a stupid idea. Had Music Scene been put in another time slot, it would have done better. This is t- Talk Shows The Advocates Roger D. Fisher hosted this serious talk show on PBS. It ran until 1984. This wasn't a fluff-type talk show, and it wasn't going for sensationalism like Donahue. He brought up issues of the day, some of which are still relevant right now. Alan Ludden's Gallery Alan Ludden was better known as a game show host for shows like GE College Bowl and Password. He tried his hand at a syndicated talk show, but it didn't work. Alan co-hosted it with his wife, the legendary comedian Betty White. It was even hoped that the show would attract younger viewers, but this didn't happen. 60 episodes were made. The David Frost Show The popular British talk show host had been around for some time before this, his American talk show debuted in syndication. It ran for three seasons. This show was how a lot of Americans got to know him. Although this show ended in 1972, he never went away and continued to work in America and Britain for a career that lasted over 50 years. The Ed Nelson Show Ed Nelson, a busy actor who had appeared on the soap opera Peyton Place, had his own short-lived talk show in syndication. It lasted 90 episodes and ended before the year was up. It was, mostly, a celebrity-based talk show and featured lots of people from the world of entertainment. He did have some topical guests, like a former member of the Ku Klux Klan and a Black Panther leader, but for the most part, he kept it light. Why didn't this last? One mistake may have been the fact that the show was 90 minutes. It wasn't unheard of to have a 90-minute talk show back then, but that's an awful big block of time for someone to watch every day. Perhaps if he kept it at a half hour or an hour, it would have held the audience's attention more. Another problem may also have been the fact that he wasn't a big enough star to draw in his own talk show audience. He wasn't a super famous personality on his own. I do think this show had the potential to be a hit because he had a lot of interesting guests and it seems like he was a good enough host, but it needed to be reworked. A shorter runtime, an interesting co-host, and perhaps a regular fun feature might have saved it. The Joe Namath Show For all his star status as a football player and public figure, Joe Namath couldn't keep a talk show going. It lasted just 13 episodes. He actually had a lot of big name guests, but he was totally uncomfortable as the host and it showed. Interviewing people was not his strong suit. This show failed and has been almost entirely forgotten. It's hard to believe the man was more comfortable wearing pantyhose than talking to people. Other TV events of 1969 Carlos Sanchez became the second and best known actor to play Juan Valdez in the commercials for the National Federation of Coffee Growers of Colombia. He played the character until 2006. Sanchez himself had been a coffee grower before he became Juan Valdez. He usually appears with his donkey Conchita. The commercials were always interesting and funny. Juan Valdez became an icon for Colombia, as well as coffee. Dick York, who played Darren Stevens on Bewitched, had long suffered from poor health. He collapsed on the set on January 13th. This led to his resignation from the show. Beginning with the sixth season, Dick Sargent was cast as the second Darren Stevens. On April 4th, CBS fires the Smothers Brothers, ending their hit show. 
Two factions butted heads for the entire three seasons of the very successful show, but the network had enough of them. Three days later, Walter Cronkite opened the evening newscast by saying that the Smothers Brothers had been replaced by Hee Haw, effective immediately. However, since it would take a while to get episodes made, specials filled the time slot until Hee Haw made its debut on June 15th. That show also became a major success. A live transmission from the moon on July 20th is seen by 720 million people around the world. Neil Armstrong stepped out of Apollo 11 and into history as the first man on the moon, followed by Buzz Aldrin. This became one of the biggest news events of the 1960s, and certainly one of the most talked about to this day. On December 2nd, after years of anticipation, the title character of I Dream of Jeannie becomes Mrs. Anthony Nelson. It was an obvious move and, I think, a good one for the series. However, both Barbara Eden and Larry Hagman publicly stated that they thought their characters being married was an awful decision. Tiny Tim, the singer and frequent laugh-in guest, got married on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show on December 17th. This was a very odd but surprisingly popular TV event with 40 million viewers. Tiny Tim was 37 at the time, and he married the woman known as Miss Vicky when she was just 17. This highly publicized marriage did not last, and both of them went on to have multiple marriages. TV Celebrity Debuts of 1969 Jane Alexander as Maggie in the NYPD episode, The Night Watch. Her career took off fast. By the next year, she was nominated for an Academy Award, and it wouldn't be the last time. Jane has had a long, successful career in film, stage, and television. One memorable role would be as Diane Fowler, the ill-fated traitor who betrayed the FBI task force in TV's The Blacklist. Michael Douglas as Young Scientist in the CBS Playhouse episode, The Experiment. He had been on stage and in films for three years, but this was his first thing on television. His breakout role came in 1972 with the popular cop show The Streets of San Francisco as Inspector Steve Keller. Michael did something rather unusual for an actor. He was able to match and even outshine his legendary actor father, Kirk Douglas. Most children of famous entertainers are lucky to be even half as successful, but Michael has maintained A-list status for many decades. Farrah Fawcett as showgirl number one in the Mayberry RFD episode, Millie the Model. 1969 was a very good year for Farrah Fawcett. She appeared on a handful of TV shows in her first movie. She became the wife of famous actor Lee Majors in 1973. This obviously didn't hurt her career, and she had a number of parts in film and television after that. Her real claim to fame was as one of the original Charlie's Angels on TV. Although she was only a regular for the first season from 1976 to 77, she still remains the most popular angel. She came back to the show for a number of appearances from 1978 to 80, but became much busier in films, other television shows, and especially TV movies. Farrah became one of the most iconic women of the 1970s decade. Nick Nolte as Vic in the Death Valley Days episode, Jimmy Dayton's Bonanza. One thing that was apparent early on is that Nick Nolte was a good actor. I've always enjoyed him as an actor, but it took him a while to catch on with audiences. The thing that really seemed to break him out was the 1976 TV miniseries, Rich Man, Poor Man. After that, he got popular for the 1977 film, The Deep. He did a number of notable things through the 70s, but the 1980s really became his decade, especially in 1982 with the action comedy film 48 Hours. He's remained incredibly active since then, and is an even better actor today. Tom Selleck as Dobie in the Lancer episode, Death Bait. By all rights, it should not have taken as long for Tom Selleck to become a big star. He's a big, good-looking guy and played cool, likable characters. However, he had to do a bunch of stuff before finding superstardom with the TV show Magnum P.I. in 1980. He made up for lost time, that's for sure, and became one of the biggest stars in the 1980s. As a matter of fact, he never stopped being popular. His other major shows include the Jesse Stone TV detective movies, 
from 2005 to 2015, and the long-running police drama Blue Bloods that began in 2010. He's also been in a number of popular films and received a lot of acclaim for his recurring role on the sitcom Friends. Burt Young as bartender in The Doctors. By the next year he did his first film. He became a big star in films and television, but has rarely been a leading man. His best known role is Polly, Rocky Balboa's brother-in-law and best friend in the Rocky films. Burt has a way of playing characters that are extremely funny and likable, as well as characters that are scary individuals. His villains are truly chilling. I prefer his good guy roles though because I like good guys better. 1969's lineup of television was the perfect way to cap off an equally weird but wonderful decade. Some new shows were very good and some should never have been attempted, but there was still a friendliness in the worst of flops. TV was not yet trying to offend its audiences as it has in recent times. The medium could use some of the heart that 1969 had. Anytime you want to revisit the TV of this year, just turn on your Tell Me Vision. <laughs>